Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, we're continuing our study of Romantic Manifesto. And I'm just delighted to have Rob, Sherry, and Marisa and Joya joining us for this series. And today we will be talking about art and sense of life. Um, last time the discussion of a sense of life was amazing. So what we're going to do is that each panelist is going to talk about their take on the chapter, um, starting with Rob, Marisa, and then uh, Shari. And then each panelist will get to put one question on the table for the panel, and then we'll open up for questions and we'll do breakout rooms and takeaways. That's the plan. Uh, we have a hard cut off at five o'clock because we have another meetup at five o'clock. So uh, let's get started, Rob. Okay, so I want to just sort of situate this, do a quick chapter summary and, and of what's going on in this chapter and situate it in the context of the other chapters. Um, actually, I think, you know, the thing that when I, when Sherry and I were reading this, the chapter two and three together, you know, uh, philosophy and sense of life and art and sense of life, I said, to her, well, you know, this is actually one article. And I reckon, because, you know, there's sort of a transition at the end of the first one, first part where she says, well, that leads us to this next topic, which we're going to talk about later. And, and I said, I recognize what's going on here, which is I've done this many times where you're writing a long article and you and the first half of it kind of gets out of control and becomes larger than you expected. It takes longer. And then you said, oh, I could just make this part one and then I'll take the rest and I'll put it into part two. And I'll publish it later, publish it next. And I noticed that these those two these two chapters are published. They said published February 1966 and March 1966. So it's back to back issues of probably would have, would have been the objectivists. Uh, at that time, the publication that they were doing. So um, th this is clearly, this is really like two parts of, of one larger article that she split up in order to have more manageable sizes uh, and possibly to fit the publication schedule. Uh, to, fit know, the to, to do it on the deadline, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, the early in, in, in the first chapter here, Psychopistemology of Art, she introduced us to her definition of art which is that art is a selective recreation of reality according to an artist's metaphysical value judgments. And she spent most of the first two chapters talking about the metaphysical value judgment part, right? Talking about what is a metaphysical physical value judgment? How is that manifested in a person's sense of life? What's its relationship to philosophical ideas? What's the relationship between the metaphysical value judgments held subconsciously, emotionally versus you know, metaphysical ideas held explicitly as a philosophical system. All of that is what she's been talking about. In chapter three, she's finally bringing us back to the part about the selective recreation of reality. And that's what chapter three is really focusing on, is that issue of selective recreation, the selectivity, and how it is that what an artist selects, what he chooses to include and what not to include, uh, uh, conveys his view of the universe. And, uh, um, you know, it's interesting because if you know this in the history of philosophy or in the history of, of philosophy, uh, theories of aesthetics, uh, the idea of art as imitating reality is, you know, of course, an old, very old concept that goes back to the very first ideas about art because art is, you know, you paint a, a, a mountain, you paint uh, a beast uh, a, a, on a cave wall. Yeah, you, you paint a, a wildebeest, you paint hunters chasing a wildebeest, you're representing reality. So the idea of art as an imitation of reality is a very old idea. And, and the, uh, if you talk to philosophers about this, they will use the term mimesis, which is basically the Greek word for imitation, for art imitating life. And so the question of, well, in what way is art imitating life has been is a very old question, but it's the selective imitation of life, the selective recreation of reality that is the big element she's introducing here and, and, and going into great depth on. Because, you know, the, she's coming in the heels of modernism and the modernist movement, which was, an, which where, where art tur and, and theories of art turned against representationalism, against imitating reality. And part of this was in reaction to things like the, the camera, the photo uh, to photography, right? So, Art, certain, the idea of art imitating life, of presenting a representation of the world, uh, uh, made a lot of sense. It made more sense, you know, before before photography, because if you wanted to know what the King of France looked like, 
right? <laughs> you want to be able to represent to to convey to somebody. Here's what the King of France looked like. There's only one way. You got to paint her down, and he sat down and he did a portrait or a sculpt or a sculpture. Actually, that's a great Bernini of mm -hmm. Louis the Fourteenth. Yes, crazy hair. <laughs> I actually recommend this uh, Bernini's portrait of a portrait bust of of Louis the Fourteenth. He's like he's got this great flowing locks of hair, and he seems like he's floating on a cloud of hair. And it sort of gets this idea of this this grandiose visionary kind of send uh, the sense of Louis the Fourteenth as a grandiose visionary building castles in the air is kind of the sense you get from it. Uh, but you know when you have the camera comes along, you just take a photograph of the guy and distribute that around and everybody can know what he looks like. So that was sort of the argument used by a lot of the modernists to say, well, imitation of life is no longer necessary because that can be done mechanically with a camera. Uh, so art really needs to be about something other than imitating life. So therefore it should be about, you know, the relationships of colors and patterns. And let's do, you know, if people who know the works of Piet Mondrian, one of the early modernists, right? Let's do this grid of squares of different sizes with different blocks of color. And this is his way of saying, look, I could do a painting that has these colors and these relationships and these spatial relationships with each other. And some of his early paintings actually started out as paintings of trees where he took the branches and sort of made them rectilinear and then enclosing boxes of color between them. And it was sort of a representation of a tree but abstracted out to here's the relationship of shapes and colors. And then he decided, well, forget about the tree. Let's just do the relationships of shapes and colors because that's all it's really about, right? If, if art doesn't have to be about recreating reality, representing reality, if it's not mimetic, to use that fancy Greek term, then it's only just about these relationships, these spatial relationships of shapes and colors. And that's what, then that's what painting should be about. And that's how you get the sort of modernist abstract painting, which is only about that. All right. So, uh, uh, Ayn Rand is sort of giving an answer to that by saying, well, yes, art is about uh, imitation of reality, but not in a mechanical and photorealistic sense. You're not just imitating, you're not just reproducing whatever happens to be around you. Uh, and maybe, by the way, some of this history may also explain why she was sort of down on photography as a, as a field of art, as a non-artistic field, because this was what was held up at the time as, you know, this is, this, you know, you can just go out and reproduce reality just by sticking your camera lens in any random direction and taking a photo. So the photography as being something that's just a, an exact reproduction of life as it is, was something that was being held up at the time as the alternative to uh, realism, to, to uh, representational art, or as, as the thing that would kill off and that make representational art unnecessary. So her answer to that is, well, you are imitating reality, but you're doing it selectively. And it's then the, the artistic power comes from that choice of selection and what you select and what you don't, what you choose and what, what you choose to include and what you don't choose to include. That is, um, uh, that is the, the power and the, the, that leads to the emotional power and the aesthetic power of art. And, you know, the relationships of, of, of shapes and colors, that's, you know, having good proportions and nice color selections, that's, the details of art, that's, that's the, uh, the details of implementation, but that's not the real essence of the aesthetic power of art. The essence of the aesthetic part of the power of art is that idea of making choices about what you, re and conveying choices about what you regard as being important and essential to life uh, and what you regard as being unimportant and, and not essential. Uh, so that's I just sort of my summary and putting it in context of what she's done in the previous chapter. So she's, she's established spent a lot of time establishing the idea of a metaphysical value judgment. And now she's ready to talk about this idea of the selectivity of the artist as conveying that view of the world. Uh, and then you know, two in two halves, one is the content and the other is the style. All right, uh, next up is uh, Maritza followed by Sherry. Maritza. Wow, um, so that, that's a fantastic uh, summary there, Rob, thanks. Um, I always feel like a little nervous going right after you. Because uh, <laughs> it's like, what else can I say? So, you always say great stuff. <laughs> thank you. Um, so interesting. I I'm going to just go off of an entirely different, slightly different jumping point here. And I'm going to quote to you the last sentence in this chapter. 
an artist reveals his naked soul in his work. And so, gentle reader, do you when you respond to it. To me, that's, that's a very poetic way of saying the same exact thing that Rob just told us. You know, the, your value comes through as an artist in your artwork, basically. If, so, so the very nature that it appeared in your work tells the viewer or the reader this is important. Not that it's important to them, but that it was important to you as the artist. And the, that is why, you know, um, Ayn Rand is telling us that art is important and why it's necessary. You know, she's saying that we've already established in the previous chapters that everyone has some form of a philosophy. Everyone needs some form of philosophy and that art concretizes our philosophy. So in this chapter, what she's saying, she's saying the same thing she's saying it, what she's telling you is art is what keeps our philosophy alive. And she says, we have to contemplate art in order to keep our philosophy alive. Now, our meaning your own personal values as it were your value you know she calls them metaphysical value judgments i'm going to truncate it and say values because that's a mouthful but basically you know if if you don't have any way of considering your own internal philosophy and values then you're rudderless and you kind of you're passive and then you have a passive sense of life which you don't even have to know what sense of life means to know that when somebody says passive sense of life, you're like, is that really what I want? Because passive sense of life to me is the is like an opposite of being alive, right? You know, there's a quote, and I don't remember who said it, but you know, they say surviving is not living. So if we view, you know, so what Ayn Rand is telling us, there's nothing wrong with creating art that shows deformed or or you know something that's ugly or defeatist, but the portrayal of that art is, if one looks at it from the perspective of what the artist is giving us, the artist is saying, these are the things that I find to be important. And so what they're saying to you is that they believe what's important in man or in man's consciousness would be something deformed or grotesque. And she's arguing for the necessity of art that shows because you know she um her 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 goal in art is always to present the her vision of an ideal man so that's why obviously the, the grotesque is not going to and appeal to her but what I like so much about this chapter is that she is very careful to make certain to explain that just because one does not like a work of art, it doesn't mean, or I'm sorry, wait, I'm saying that wrong. Let me, let me try this again. She says, it's okay to say that you don't, that something is a great work of art, but that you don't like it. And the reason being is she, she wants to clarify that the aesthetic judgment is different from, I'm killing the way she says this. I have it written down though. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm losing what I'm trying to say here, I apologize. So what she's telling you is that a, a work of art can be great, even if it does not represent any values that resonate with you. The fact that it forces you to say, this is not life as I view it. That's what makes it a great work of art. And, and she's, she has said that before, um, but in, in this chapter, I like that she's very careful to provide clear lines 
stating this, like I, I feel, what, what I feel like is this, she, she was making some points with the previous two chapters. And in this chapter, I feel like she goes back to the previous two chapters to clarify on this almost subtle distinction. Like, don't get caught up on saying, but wait, but, but she's talking about clear lines and, and, and this and that negates Rembrandt because you know he uses blurring. And I don't think that's quite exactly the point. Um, I, I, so I, as an example, I, I had mentioned, I, I told the, the group here, the panelists before you guys all showed up that I was contemplating whether or not I would share with you a, a music. So for the most part, she, Ayn Rand talks mostly about literature. We've gone on quite a bit here about the artwork. We haven't touched too much on music and music has undergone so much change in the last, you know, many years. I'm gonna mention to you a, a song that is actually, it's, well, it's not just a song. This, this artist is a German artist. He actually is singing in German. And so I, I started listening to German music when I was teaching myself German because that's the best way to pick up the language, right? And this artist, first of all, he doesn't, when you look at him, you would be like, really, that's, that's a, a German guy? Because he kind of looks like he could be Irish. He's got red hair and all kinds of freckles. That's an aside, right? Our, our stereotyping. But he's singing. It's like a pop rap music. But then there is this amazing orchestra in it. And, and if, if somebody's curious enough or bored enough, this guy's name is Peter Fox. And the song I would direct you to would be Alice Noi. Everything is new, right? And he came on holiday to the United States and met a drum band from a college down south. And he liked them so much, he invited them to be in his album. Now he made one album. He didn't enjoy the fame it brought him, so he refused to ever do a second album. And now he's still doing music, but he's doing it under other musicians in, in, a, in a chorus. But the, to me, when I hear that, there is a mix of so many different components that it feels like it takes. So I often tell people I, I, that I have to figure out ways to engage one part of my brain so that the other part of my brain can do work or do something. But this song stops me in its tracks because I feel like it reaches into my brain and massages all those separate little components. And I feel like that's what Ayn Rand is saying that all artwork has the capacity to do. Because what it might do is it might feel like it's slicing all those little components. So it might not be good, but that's okay because it's making you feel. And, and she's saying, you know, she, she does clarify that when she talks about emotion, she means sensing or feeling. And, and, and that's, so I'm gonna stop there. Thanks. How do you spell Fox? Is it F-A-U-L-K-S? No, Fox, F-O-X. F-O-X, okay. Yeah. Yes, I was going for the more German option. Yeah. <laughs> it's not at all. It's, it's a, and the video also is crazy. He, he puts the, all the orchestra and monkey, um, masks no idea why but i guess i'll look forward to it. this is great you got to learn your music ahead of time because you can't see the notes but with the mask on it's it's fantastic i am he's one of my favorites okay well i think this, sherry go ahead this is a nice tie-in we kind of without having planned this out we're kind of making a nice spiral here um because i'm tying into uh that that same line of um, this is, uh, this was a shock again, the, this time that I read through the book, it's a philosophy of aesthetics of literature, not all the other arts necessary. Oh, so Rob's a gonna, philosophy of literature. So keep pointing this out to her. He keeps putting that <laughs> in front of my face, uh, <laughs> because, um, this chapter, and I'm, I'm going to, should I just, I'm going to say it. Yeah. It's shocking. I hate this chapter. I hate it like 
somebody has made the most perfect chocolate souffle. It's fresh out of the oven. You can smell it. And then they don't let you eat it. Because what she does is she has this beautiful long description of literature and what she likes and exactly why. Um, it, and she does it twice. She does it at a personal level and then at a more philosophical at a thinking level, thinking, going through the artworks that way. Um, but this is something that is throughout this chapter on all the other arts, she is almost using shorthand, which I think sometimes leads people to assume that shorthand is the way to understand all the other arts. Music and architecture are separate issues and we'll probably talk to them about Next those chapter. as we're going into the other chapters. But with all the other arts, she's almost using a shorthand. So like Maritza was talking about, um, she makes a comment in here about clean lines versus fog uh, or blurry lines. Um, and I think she's setting up a, a false alternative there that it's it, you can have one or you can't have the other or this one's good and that one's bad. Um, we talked about the uh, the the wanderer on a sea of fog that there's plenty of fog in that one. Um, and it has a totally different sort of sense of life to it. Um, so that is why and this is, is, is a very frustrating chapter for me because I it's like we're so close and I just I want to go the rest of the way. Um, and she doesn't do that for us. Um, she actually even goes into this one parenthetical paragraph. The aesthetic principles which apply to all art, regardless of an individual's artistic philosophy and which must guide an objective evaluation are outside the scope of this discussion. I will mention only that such principles are defined by the science of aesthetics, a task of which modern philosophy has failed dismally. And I actually write in the margins of every copy of the book I've ever owned. This whole paragraph is circled and I write, ugh. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's her saying she's not because she's it. not going there. And that's exactly where I want her to go. So I have, um, taken the uh, time to go ahead and do that. <laughs> so I, I have been, I don't know if many of you have read these over the years, many years ago, it was before we had kids. Um, I was writing regularly a column called Things of Beauty, where I was taking sometimes photographs, sometimes works of art, sculpture, sometimes tools and writing about them in the way that she writes about literature in this chapter. And um, I think that's the best way to use this chapter as a launch pad into getting into the details of this um, and spread it beyond just the philosophy of literature. So I pulled up one of the things of beauty that I wrote. When was I wrote this one in? 2018. Two years ago. Um, she, she, you wrote about this painting like 12 years ago. But I, that's lost in the mist of time. It take me a long time to find it. But this is what you wrote more, more recently, yeah, which I so, think is more interesting. So what I wrote about this painting about 12 years ago, and I talked about it like I did Linda Mann's painting, but in more depth. So I was talking about how your eye is moving through the painting and things like that. Um, if I can find that, we can pull that up and, and pass that on for people at another time. But this one takes it to that next step. So you first have to do that detail observation of a work of art. And then you take the step and put those pieces together. Um, and we're gonna pull up here, we're gonna share screen. Let's see if I can do this. Which one is it? Oh, uh, you're looking for Chrome, this one. This one here. Oh, first one okay. we have the very fun, non-fun thing here. But we'll all talk about this when we share it. Let's share sure. it. You, no, we're not going right. here. No, okay. no, we are? No, well, we're not. Okay, later. Okay. So we're going to start at this painting. Um, it, I, and I can't see anybody's faces now that this is up. So um, 
Srikant can see everybody. So let me know if anybody is familiar with this painting. Okay, uh, if you're familiar with the painting, just in the participants window, just say yes. No. Oh, see, it's yeah, really high. Or in chat. That's good, that's good. Now you can all see this, right? Yep. Okay. So um, this is a painting that's at the Freer Gallery in Washington, DC. And I was gonna read what I wrote, but I decided- Well, um, no, she, shared, she turned to me and said, how do you expect me to read this without crying? And I said, I said, I don't. <laughs> and said, so I said, well, then you can read it. So, I so Rob's gonna reading. read my writing. <laughs> All right, so this is from a couple of years ago. Sherry wrote about this. I first became aware of this painting on a visit to the Freer Gallery in Washington, DC many years ago. I was at the museum that day to see something entirely different. And as you do when you're on your way somewhere, you walk past things fairly quickly and they catch a little of your attention. Yet as I turned a corner to enter the staircase to another floor, I was stopped dead in my tracks by this large painting over seven feet in height. It was hanging on the wall at the, backdrop, at the back of the landing. The location itself threw me for a loop, but I angrily asked Rob, why on earth would a museum hang something like this in a random staircase? See below for the actual reason. Truthfully though, it wasn't the location that stopped me in my tracks. It was the painting that suddenly demanded all of my attention. The look of quiet determination on the face of the central figure, just as much defiant strength as there is gentle affection, very much resonated with me. Here was a portrayal of a woman who conveyed both tenacity and tenderness. The story behind it explains why. This is a painting of Thayer's three children painted shortly after his wife's death when the eldest daughter took charge of her younger siblings for a time. At a time of such grief, the father portrays his eldest daughter as the one who takes it in stride, gently guiding her siblings to move forward. Notice the difference between her facial expression and that of her younger siblings. The young brother on our right has heavily lidded eyes that reflect deep sadness. His gaze looks unfocused as if he's unable to fully process what has befallen his life. His facial muscles are slack, the corners of his mouth droop downward and he looks emotionally lost. The younger sister by contrast has a more quizzical expression as if she is just starting to figure out this new world. Her eyes are fully open, her gaze is direct, her lips almost pursed together with a mind full of questions. Then take a fresh look at the eldest daughter's face. Her eyes are bright and strongly focused. Her lips are not loosely slack nor pinched tight with emotion, but resolutely tight in the same expression that we all get when we are determined to do something. But notice also how Thayer uses shadow to depict the emotions in each face. The youngest daughter has the brightest highlight of happiness. The sun is sinking into the shadows, but the central figure has the most even light across her face. Please take advantage of your ability to zoom in on this high resolution image to look deeply in her eyes. Okay, I'm gonna, Can my apologies inducing? for inducing um, motion sickness. Um, here, over These here. two fingers are turning. You move it over, I can't okay. figure out your no, screen. I, okay, yes. <laughs> okay, we got oh, everything but her face. Okay. I mean, oh, see, this is, yeah, okay. So we're just gonna you have to- move to, this up there first. We're just gonna have to go with what we got because there we go. Now maybe we can zoom in. You gotta get, you gotta get the cursor there. Okay, there we go. That's as close as we're gonna get to a close up of her face. Oh, there you go. Um, where was I? Oh yes, uh, the evenness of the light allows us to fully see both of her eyes, including the spark of a highlight in her right eye. We need this evenness of light to see the details of her fixed gaze and the set corners of her mouth. He also uses much finer brush strokes and sharper contrasts of line and color to draw our focus to her face. If you look closely at the younger children's faces, you see how much more loosely painted their details are. But perhaps you were most struck by the painting's title, A Virgin, and you were thinking that with the death of his wife, Thayer was portraying his daughter with religious overtones. After all, it probably hasn't escaped your notice that those clouds behind her sure do look an awful lot like wings, don't they? Here we have cloud allusions to wings and a title that alludes to the Virgin Mary. So is Thayer showing us a portrayal of his eldest daughter as an angel? I don't think so. Thayer was a naturalist early on in his life and spent a great deal of time painting animals, especially birds. And you often see his children portrayed with actual wings in other paintings, such as the one he actually titled Angel but I don't think that's what he's trying to say here. Does this central figure remind you of any other great work of art? The forward striding figure with wings outstretched behind her. 
Is this the winged victory, perchance? Now, can you go mm -hmm. to um, the Zoom to work in there? I guess the sword one. With the image of the winged victory in your mind, notice the flowing drapery of her dress and how the drapery billows out behind her on the breeze. Should I go back to this one? Yeah, you can go back. Notice how the fine fabric is blown against her leg as she steps forward and how the wind puddled the fabric into coils around the low, her lower leg. By now, it probably takes conscious effort not to see these clouds as anything but victory's powerful wings. Charles Freer, who bought this painting from Thayer, certainly thought so. When he exhibited it, exhibited it in 1910, he had it placed alongside a plaster cast of the Winged Victory. Its normal location was in the landing of a grand staircase in his Detroit mansion, and it is in honor of his original, of his original placement in his own home <coughs> that the museum chose their location for this painting. It turns out to be a good choice. No matter where it is placed, viewers would feel as if this life-size figure were stepping forward. But placing it at the back of a staircase landing forces the viewer to walk toward the painting, exaggerating the effect until it seems as if this figure is actually advancing toward you. When we think of the forward motion of the winged victory, positioned on the prow of a ship, it puts a different light on this painting, doesn't it? The winged victory depicts the moment that victory charges in, the moment she alights on the deck of the ship, wings still fully outstretched, wind flapping her clothing as the ship charges forward. How does this fit in with sad grief? I think we are seeing Thayer depicting a moment of parental pride in seeing the strength of spirit in his daughter in the face of grief. In the wake of his own sorrow, Thayer turns to his immense canvas to depict his daughter's inner self as a kind of mournfully victorious goddess. It is no wonder the painting stops you dead in your tracks. That's what we Stop share. Yeah. Wow. That was amazing. And I think that's one that not a lot of people know about. It's not a very, not an exceptionally well-known painting. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's um, getting an idea of the level of what can be read from works of art. Um, we don't have to, her, she's intending her shorthand to be just that. She's explained to us that she isn't going to that level of depth on anything other than literature, um, but she shows us how to do that. Um, and doing so is a really wonderful thing. Wow, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sherry. That, that was just incredible, thanks. Thank you. Um, so um, I, want to, I want to go in um, I don't know what to say after that. That's, that's just, just great. Um, so let me go ahead and um, look at art from the perspective of the consumer of art um, and ask the question of what is it that art does for you, does for your sense of life? What does it do for you? Um, because what it is doing is that it's actually supporting your sense of life you know, your explicit philosophy and your implicit philosophy you hold. And it requires, you know, kind of forward thinking. It requires conceptualization. It requires ambitious action. What art gives you is the immediate experience of living in that world fully now in the most intense way possible. So it is a way of recharging, reconnecting to your deepest values and doing so in a visceral way where you actually feel all of the, the sum of your philosophy in action, in consciousness, right then and there. And that's what art does for people. And that's what it is, that's its function. Um, it's a profound function and it's a profound necessity because it's like a, it's like a support system. 
Uh, in some ways, other people do that too for you because their sense of life, their own actions, their own lives kind of act as perform the same function. But art does that in a highly selected, highly stylized way. Um, and I think that is, that is the power of, of art, um, looking at it from, from a consumer perspective. Sherry, you had something. Um, I just wanted to ask this of a question, and you asked us to have questions for the other panelists, but this is one for all of us to think of between now and maybe next week. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm stealing this straight from Srikant, because <laughs> this is a question he popped out at all of us after Thanksgiving dinner and pie. And then while we're all sitting down half asleep, maybe he says, okay, I'm gonna ask you each a question. And that was what form of art is your favorite? And then the follow-up question was, which form of art do you consume the most? Um, and well, it, it, that ended up going, that conversation lasted for more than two hours, I'm pretty sure. There was probably another round of pie in there. I'm not <laughs> sure about that, pretty sure. Um, you can't have the pile at once you gotta you gotta have the first round of pie and then wait a little while yeah each piece is <laughs> yeah anyway um but so that's a really interesting question and for many of us that were sitting around talking about it um what was most interesting is the one that we found that was the most personally important to us and the one that we consumed the most were not necessarily the same in fact most of us they they weren't the same That's, that's fascinating. Um, okay, so now there is a chance, this is a chance for panelists to put uh, any more questions. So uh, this is a question for, uh, so let me take that as a question okay. for, for me. Um, the art that I care about most is music. Uh, you know, I grew up listening to Indian classical music. Um, it's very powerful and I sing. So for me, it's like, I'm a big fan of um, participatory sports as opposed to spectator sports. And I think that when you actually create art, your ability to appreciate that and what that art does and how it works in you uh, goes up like order of magnitude, mm -hmm. probably more than that. So for me, music is, is the primary, primary thing. And I, that is the one I consume most because in New York, I can just walk around and sing. And uh, everybody thinks everybody is crazy here anyway. So it's, it's, it's okay. You can do that. And, um, and you can listen to music and you can sing. So, uh, and I, I like walking, so it integrates perfectly with, with, my, with, with my life. So that's, that's my answer. For me, Shikant, it's also music. Music is uh, the one that I, I think would be most important. Um, you know, everyone in my life has a theme song and um, most uh, of my life uh, major events also have a theme song. And I listen to music across um, a variety of many different languages. And um, I have said before, and I'll repeat, if, if you're trying to learn a language, the fastest way to pick it up is to listen to their music. Um, I, I, I'm, I pick up languages very easily but um, I think even if it's harder for you to pick up a language, music will facilitate. And um, so, you know, on any random day, you can hear, you know, my, my playlist seems rather all over the place. Interestingly enough, though, what I consume the most, the art I consume the most is actually literature. I, I read almost more than I listen to music, although I, can, I do both in tandem. So maybe that's debatable. Mm. Um, I, I do. Um, I know a lot of people say they cannot listen to music while reading, but I don't have that problem. It, it, I like, I don't know, music sometimes is soothing. And like I said, sometimes I need to give a piece of my brain something else to do so the rest of it can focus on, you know, the book. <laughs> Rob can actually write not only while listening to music, but while singing the music. So can I, yep. I haven't figured out that one yet. Yep. 
Um, I, I don't listen, write to music as much anymore. I used to do it. So when I had a column that was like, I had to sit down and write it at a very tight deadline. And I used to listen to like music that I would not like say was great music, but music that was a lot, it, was, it had to be highly energetic music. I'd actually Driving. write my columns again. <laughs> for a while there. I was writing, like, I was writing these like rapidly pro-capitalist columns uh, while listening to, to the Red Army Chorus singing, <laughs> singing, <laughs> Uh, Russian military, uh, and there's these Russian military anthems, you know, dun, 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 dun. but it's this incredibly energetic and motivating music. These military, this military marches, you know, with the Red Army Chorus singing. It's the soundtrack from the Hunt for Red <laughs> October. Was, it was, I got it because of the soundtrack that had Hunt for October, and I wanted something that sounded like that. Oh, God. But, uh, but I, I, I would listen to highly motivating and energetic music because that's why I needed the energy to like power through. It's like I have you know, another five hours and I have to file this column and it has to be done and it has to be done, you know, polished. I have, I have to be working constantly, very focused, very hard. I don't listen to music much while I'm writing anymore, but I think for most people, it, the, probably the amount, the thing that they um, uh, uh, consume most, the art, maybe the art they consume most would probably be music because it's around us everywhere. Everybody has an iPod or, you know, streaming service or whatever. You can turn on the radio in the car and that's so in the car we have we have our ipod hooked up and you know we've got like 27 37 hours of christmas music that we have in a loop going on right at the, uh, this time of year and so i listen to a lot of that and i play music of course i'm a I, i'm a very amateur violinist and an amateur and a halfway decent amateur pianist so i play music um but so that's the one that i, I consume the most of but other than that, I'd say that the one that I is most powerful to me is probably the sculpture. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple sculptures in the house, so I suppose I consume that on a daily basis. But um, and consume it in the sense of actually looking at it and concentrating on it is, is less common. But I thought I, we were talking about this last night, and I thought it was interesting that the the two mediums that I name as the my most my favorite and my most widely consumed are the ones that are actually the farthest away from what I do for a living. Mm. Right, because I'm a writer. I work with words. I I, I read relatively little liter literature because I'm reading for a living all day. I mean, I do nothing. I sit down and I just read. I read articles. I read nonfiction. I read a huge amount of nonfiction. Um, and so I think that what I need is something that's as far away from that as possible. And I find performing music to be very much like that. That you have to be so non-abstract. And so in the moment and focused on the specific concretes of what you're doing, and if you lose concentration for even a moment on exactly what you're doing at this time, uh, you, you're gonna get off track. You have, you have to think about the music to know this should be louder, this should be softer, you know, how, how you should perform it. But while you're doing it, you're not thinking, your fo you're, you're not thinking in this abstract way. You're very, by, by, you know, forced, by, by, by necessity, you're forced to focus on the very concrete, in very concrete and in the moment kind of way, which is the opposite of everything else I do in life, which is I think part of the reason why it uh, it's what I consume a lot of. And and I'll I'll answer my own question um, the same way I think I answered it that night. Shrikan asked it originally, which was um, asking me to choose between the arts is like asking me to choose my favorite child, and I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, music uh, might be the one I consume the most uh, because along with Rob, I'm, I'll also play. Um, I, I play both uh, cello and, and piano, um, very much amateur in both cases. <laughs> I picked up the cello at what, 49, 49, yeah. 49. It's a tough to learn a string instrument uh, in middle age, but it, it's coming along. Um, I can play Mary Had a Little Lamb really nicely yes. now. Anyway, right. um, but but I also would like to add in that there is a sense of life um, expressed in um, industrial design, in mm -hmm. um, decorative arts, in all of those other things, in in the in in automobiles, um, in engine parts. Um, it's it's there. You can see. Uh, the thought process that goes through all of those things too. Excellent. Um, Marisa, do you have a question for the panel? I, I do not. Um, I should, sorry. 
That's uh, I do, I do want to say very quickly that it's funny that the what Rob was describing for how he approaches making music made me think of how I would approach um, poetry. I feel like I have two super different approaches to poetry, though, in that sometimes I like to sit and it's like a, a structured thought experiment, and I'll like try to challenge. Like you guys know what a VNL is, right? Um. And um, uh, do not go gently into that good night is yeah. an example of it. Mm -hmm. So rage, rage against the dying light. So it's a very, it's one of the, it's one of the hardest and strictest uh, verse um, formats for a poem. And um, so for kicks and giggles, I, I told myself I would write one. It's, it's incredibly hard and I've done it before. So I, but I like to do that. I like to give myself challenges for how I'm, so in other words, I set the parameters and then I force my poem into that parameter. But sometimes you can't, like sometimes you just sit down and it comes out like word vomit all over the page and there's just no thinking and you're not even sure what's coming out on the paper until you're done. And it's, I almost feel like that's kind of exactly what you were describing. Mm -hmm. So I find it interesting that, it, that so different forms of art, mm -hmm. kind of similar expression, but but it's it's kind of, you know, um, the, uh, you know, Anne Rand tells us that it's stylizing reality. So I, that's just just an observation. Yeah. Rob, and do you have a question? Do I have a question? Um, well, I want to get to, in this chapter, there's a whole discussion about subject versus style. Please. Mm. Um, I guess my question is, do people, what do people think in terms of, do you respond more and perhaps more deeply to the subject or to the style of a work of art? Because I can think of a number of ones where I, I love something because of its style and don't even think that much about a subject and vice versa. I think that if I can answer your question oh, first, yeah, sure. I think that I might I explain, I know you didn't ask me this, <laughs> but I think that might explain um, early in our relationship how I would, uh, I had music that I liked um, and never heard the words, never heard the words. It was about the music. I mean, the words could have been blah, 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 blah. It, it could, that's all it could have been because I wasn't paying one bit of attention to the words. I was listening to the music until Rob forced me to focus on what the words were. And in some cases, I'm going back to the blah, 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 <laughs> so that I can listen to the music. Um, but um, and I think it's really interesting that Maritza and Rob both are much more in the liter literary style um, and their focus is on the words, especially. Um, I'm much more visual. Um, so for me, architecture, painting, sculpture, music, it's more um, about the sound and the, the, the color and the light. The colors are usually quite important to me. Uh, for me, it's very odd. Uh, for, for music, it is almost entirely style. Uh, it is the artist, like, for example, in Indian classical music, well, I'll give you an example of uh, Western, like Ella Fitzgerald. You know, Ella, the, the way she sings, you know, she can sing anything. Okay, she can sing anything, and it's just amazing because just, just her style of doing anything that she does in music is so incredible. The, the level of kind of virtuosity, creativity, variety, improvisation ability, um, trying to kind of do this entire sequence of patterns and just exploring it. It's just incredible. Um, but in literature, for me, subject is critical. I mean, I would, wouldn't read anything unless the subject is good. Um, so I think it's different for me. Uh, Marisa? Um, I think... It oscillates, to be honest, um, for, I, I would agree for music style is what comes up first, but it depends because I can't, I, I'm not a huge fan of music that has like four words um, and they repeat, but there's also the thing of, so when you're listening, for example, to music in a language you don't understand, you're obviously not caring about the words, but it's the style. But the neat thing is if, if you're learning that language, it adds something to now suddenly be able to understand the, the words as they become part of your vocabulary. 
And now when you hear it, you're also getting the words. I feel like it adds another layer to the enjoyment of that artwork, as it were. And it's kind of the same for books because there's some books that I've read that I, I love the subject, but I'm like, oh my God, but you need a writing class. <laughs> and, and that makes it harder to enjoy the book, no matter how well written. And then there's some books where I don't, I'm kind of lukewarm about them, but the writing is so good that I need to keep reading because I it just, it's a well-formed, you know, story as it were. So I, I don't know, for me, it's, that's a hard one. I don't know if I can pick. I think it depends on the medium. And Rob, what's your answer? Oh gosh, my answer. Um, see, I posed the question, didn't think that much about my own answer. <laughs> uh, I think, no, I, I do have one, one thing I would say is I think specifically with the visual arts, uh, with, uh, um, with sculpture and painting, I really respond a lot to style, almost so much that it, to this type, like Vermeer, she has some sort of harsh words about the naturalistic, the naturalistic subject matter of Vermeer. And I'm like, I never noticed. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I just love the style. His style is so, per, so beautiful. And I didn't care what the subject matter was so much. Uh, and so I think that's definitely true with the visual arts, that, that sense of clarity. And I'm, uh, unlike Mirza, I am oddly forgiving, uh, for a writer, I'm oddly forgiving of amateurish writing if I like the, uh, the subject matter or something, the, the, you know, the story that's being told. Because uh, once you, if you, if I get into, and, and I've, I've had occasion to do this a couple of times, because, you know, with books that the kids are, books that the kids get into, where they love the story. And I was like, okay, it's not as well written as I would like, but I also feel that once I start getting into it and I start getting into the story, if it's an interesting story and I want to find out more, I can't put it down. I have to keep reading, even if I'm like, even if I know the style is not that terrific. So interestingly, Rob, a quick question for you. Um, do you have any books from your youth, um, either teenage or preteen, that in your mind you still like it, but you cannot for the life of you pinpoint why? Oh. <laughs> um, Gosh, I, no, I, I think it, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's, I, it's not so much that I can't pinpoint why, but I have something that I, I don't like as much now as I used to when I was younger, but I think in most cases I can kind of figure out why. I have, uh, um, there's, there's a book called My, My Darling, My Hamburger, and it's like <laughs> some kind of tweeny novel that I read when I was a kid, and I remember that I, I felt like I, I loved it in that moment because it ended sadly. And I was like, this is more true to life. And wow. I remember saying that. And I used to hold it up to people like, this is a more true to life novel. Cause you know, at that time, my whole life was falling down around me. You know, it was a, the same years my folks were, were sick and dying. And I was like, this is more true to life. But now I actually went back and read it. And I was like, this is not the work of art. I thought it was. <laughs> You gotta be careful when you go back and investigate yeah, those yeah. the things you fell in love with at a young age. Yeah. So let's let's go to uh, questions from everybody now. There is it's going to be Dave, Lloyd, and Jyoti uh, next, folks. If you have questions, just go ahead and type an exclamation mark in Zoom, uh, or raise your hand in Zoom. Uh, number two, keep on topic. At this point, we're just taking only questions, so keep your comments very brief and just focus on questions. Uh, after which we're going to do breakout rooms and then we get to come back and then you can give your full takeaways uh, and we're going to have, you'll have time to discuss them. So at this point, keep your questions brief. So it's going to be Dave, uh, Lloyd, Jyoti and Ash. Dave, go ahead. Srikant and panel, I, I really appreciate this examination of art and how to look at art. And to keep it brief, what fascinated me and the three daughters was the arm. And the fact it was a broad stroke without detail, it seems to me if, if the artist wanted you to look at the arm, they would have put in detail for you to focus on. The fact it is like a reflection of the sun, it was just bright and it was just to emphasize the three together and also pointing at her head as the uh, thing we talked about last week. But anyway, great interpretation, really appreciated uh, seeing that today. I guess there's a little bit of elbow there, but other than to me, it's yeah. just almost yeah. a broad stroke. Yeah, this um, that gets into, that's something I mentioned in that Things of Beauty column, but 
um, when you, we can point it out because it comes as what you're mentioning here. Um, notice in both cases, her arms are, um, everything but her face is quite soft and muted. And this is gets back to, remember we were talking about Linda Mann's painting. There are some areas of the painting where they're softer focus. There's something interesting there. Your eye can dwell, but your, yeah, she, she, the point is to bring you back, to keep bringing you back to the point of focus. And that's her face in the center. And you'll notice that the shape, you know, this triangular shape of figures that will carry your eye back. You know, it's up. And this was in the other piece. If we can find that, it would be great. Yeah. Um, where the, the shapes of the drapery and, and the posture and the arms, everything tends to bring you right back to that spot in the painting where the detail is crispest. That is bringing your attention right there on her face in the center. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, next up is uh, Lloyd, uh, Jyoti, Ash, and Jonathan. Lloyd, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I read this uh, pretty carefully, this chapter, and um, I uh, I didn't understand. Also, you mentioned Vermeer, and uh, he was a, a genre painter, uh, just painting scenes of common life, you know, in uh, in Holland. And I, I didn't understand what her objection was. She says um, he's got a bleak metaphysics of naturalism. I wasn't sure what she meant by that. Um, I think she means by that, that these are not um, heroic people doing heroic things. They're- Or unusual people doing unusual things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so she, you know, a lot of Vermeer's paintings are portraits of, in one case, the maid. Uh, you know, the girl, the pearl earring, I think was the maid um, or his wife and just in and around the kitchen. So she has some kind of comments like next to the kitchen. Maybe Ayn Rand didn't know how to cook. That could have been it. <laughs> but but the thing that's, again, that's where you're getting into the shorthand. She's not explaining all that like she does with her literature yeah. comments. I, I call the very telegraphic style that she has. Here. Yeah, yeah, telegraph shorthand. But when you think about it, um, again, you always have to take the whole context. So Vermeer was painting in a Northern climate uh, where the light is precious. Um, it doesn't last all year. And it, when you start looking at, you can all go Google uh, Vermeer's painting and start looking through all of his paintings. What you'll see is a consistency among them is this beautiful light I mean, he's almost like the light itself is the subject of his paintings. It's not necessarily the girl in the pearl earring. It's the way the light reflects off of those things. That's kind of his precious thing. And that seems really wonderful <laughs> to me. Uh, next up is going to be Jyoti, Ash, and Jonathan. Jyoti, go ahead. Yeah, I have a, I don't know what kind of question it is. Um, anyone can answer this one. The preference for art, can it change because of the state of mind you are in, in different phases of your life? Am I making sense? Yes. Do you want to answer that one? Unless somebody else has something else. Um, I, I, I think that's probably true. Um, I mean, I, I think I think it's definitely true. I'm trying to think of how to come up with examples or, I mean, I, go ahead. Okay, I'm just gonna step over him. <laughs> Take a look at Ayn Rand's work, mm. We the Living versus Atlas Shrugged. I mean, it's stark, it's a really stark difference. And I think that's, yeah, it's it, because the sense of life, um, it, it, it comes through whatever work of art you're creating. Um, it comes through as your personality just walking down the street, you know what I mean? It's definitely going to change um, in your mindset and in your mood and, and throughout different phases of your lifetime will change. Sherry, can you give an example of Michelangelo's uh, transformation? Yes. We've talked about that before, yep. like Michelangelo's David, 
uh, was in the, you know, was young, prime of his life, confident, um, strong and uh, powerful. And later in his life, uh, the more and more he becomes an inner turmoil between religion and, and other aspects of his life, the more his um, sculptures twist and the more his paintings. Now, remember Michelangelo was a painter, was a sculptor and he was an architect. So um, the paintings and the sculpture get this twisting form to them. And if you can ever get into, um, in Florence, there's a staircase um, in the Laurentian Library, and the staircase itself. If you can ever get to it, because yeah, both every times time we've been, been there, there they closed. Um, but the staircase itself sort of twists and kind of comes out. At, it, it's got to be a pretty powerful staircase to climb. Uh, I've yet to do it in yeah. person, but no. anyway, um, there is another sense that uh, you can see different progression in his life. You can tell once you get to know his art, you can look at a piece, maybe one you didn't know before. And having seen a bunch, a bunch of his, you'd be able to tell a pretty good guess whether this is early Michelangelo or late Michelangelo. Um, go, go ahead. But the, with using Michelangelo there is kind of an unhappy example. It's like his, his, it's about his tortured soul developing. Uh, I want to use something that's more like a more normal example of how your uh, taste would change. There's a lot of music that I listened to when I was younger. It include classical, oh, I'm a classical music guy, so I, I listened to a lot of classical music. There's a lot of pieces that I feel like I didn't really understand when I was younger. And now with like more life experience behind me, I'm like, oh, now I get what that, song, what that piece is about, that, that Chopin piece. Now I get what that piece is about. You know, and now I get what the whole depth of emotion that's in there, I didn't get the first time around. Mm -hmm. It was only with later life experience, more experience of life and more experience going through all the different kinds of emotions that he's trying to capture that I'm now like, okay, now I can get this on, you know, get all the different levels of what's happening here. So it's partly a matter of, of your expanded experience, your expanded knowledge. Um, it can also be a matter of what you need psychologically at a certain point of your life. You know, uh, if you're when you're just starting out at a new job or a new career, you know, and uh, especially when you're younger, you need certain kinds of motivations that might be different from what you need when you are uh, towards the end of a career. Right? Or, or occurs when you when you have kids, you you know you have different concerns in life. So I think that that does have an impact. Yeah, absolutely. And what I would say is that you know art supports your sense of life, and especially over a period of time, there are things about your sense of life, things that are valuable to you, things that are important to you, are going to change over that period of time, and you're going to gravitate towards art that supports that particular thing at that particular stage. So uh, excellent question, Jyoti. Next up is Ash followed by Jonathan. Ash? Hi, um, yeah, so earlier Maritza was talking a little bit about this distinction that Ayn Rand makes in the, in the chapter between uh, one's personal response to a work of art uh, versus an objective aesthetic evaluation of the work. And, uh, and sort of later in the chapter, Ayn Rand does talk about aesthetic evaluation in terms of uh, the, you know, uh, the technical mastery with which an artist conveys their theme and things like that. But she doesn't really kind of go too deeply into, you know, the explicitly or explicitly in this chapter about kind of the fundamental standards of aesthetic evaluation. Um, and earlier in the chapter, there was an interesting passage where she says the function of psychological, so she, first she talks about are as uh, performing this function of psych psychological integration to concretize your broadest uh, metaphysical abstractions. And then she says the function of psychological integration is to make certain connections automatic so that they work as a unit and don't require a conscious process of thought every time they're evoked. Um, and so, and elsewhere in her, her, you know, like in her ethical writing, she talks about standards of evaluation um, are based on uh, the function uh, that uh, something is supposed to perform. So I'm wondering what you guys' take on, do, do you think integration um, or the level or degree of integration that a work of art achieves is sort of the, the basic standard of aesthetic evaluation or, or do you think there's something else 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that the more integrated um, this, oh, we lost a painting. The more integrated a work of art is between its sense of life, between its style and its subject, and all those little details of how it's created, if all of the more integrated it is, I think the more powerful they become. And generally, those are the works of art that stand the test of time of centuries versus ones that are a decade in, in power. Um, so I think that, it, that, that that's the benefit of a more integrated work of art. Um, there are plenty of very, very integrated works of art um, and architecture and music uh, that have a negative um, uh, sense of life in my view, but I appreciate them um, as a, almost as a, a scientist would piece apart how they created, how all those parts add up to the integrated whole. Um, but you almost have to disengage. You almost have to, in those cases, disengage your, um, your own sense of life reaction to those things. And that comes with practice to be able to do that, um, to say, okay, yes, this is my reaction. I'll acknowledge it and I'll set it aside and then study, you know, it's, um, you know, it, like a doctor, you know, there's a level of separation in there. Um, so when I look at things that are very highly integrated, but um, repulsive to my sense of life, I have to do that. I have to have that separation. And Ayn Rand tells us that, um, you know, the artist is stylizing reality. So the goal is an increased integration. And, and as it's, as the viewer, the more that you perceive a work of art to be integrated with your sense of life, the less dissonance that you'll have with it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I, so when she's saying, you know, but you, you want to try to view it from an aesthetics separate from that like visceral reaction, because like she says, you know, she, she talks all the time about how, you know, Victor Hugo is one of her favorite um, literature um, artist, but she opposes just about every philosophical type of aspect he's presenting. And so that's the example she gives when she says, but his, it's very clear to see his sense of life in his works. There's this phenomenal integration that allows one to read it and still see that there is um, this great cohesion, even while acknowledging for yourself that this is not the philosophy that I, I would agree with, or this, this doesn't work for me, but wow. And, and I think that's what she means. Excellent. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take one last question from Jonathan, and then we're going to do breakout rooms for 20 minutes. And then we get to come back and talk about our takeaways and ask for the questions after the discussion. You can you get to put one question on the table uh, when you come back. All right, so Jonathan, go ahead. Thank you, thanks uh, to the panel again. So my question is about learning to appreciate art. Um, what are your thoughts on having to work to appreciate a piece of art? For example, um, I've often been recommended uh, Dante's Divine Comedy and I try to work to understand it and I read it. And I'm just like, this is so boring. I don't know what's going on. And it's a question because how do I know I'll actually appreciate it if I work to appreciate it? And is it worth it? Um, and there are other examples, you know, I could go on about Homer's Odyssey, some of Dostoevsky and so on, um, which doesn't immediately resonate. So if anyone has any thoughts on that and how that works in terms of like, functioning of consciousness as far as uh, Ayn Rand's theory on, on art goes. Well, I just have one thing to say about which is I, I, I think there is a sort of a, a school of art and it's actually probably a school of romanticism, but not Ayn Rand's version of romanticism. 
in which the idea is that art's supposed to speak to your emotions directly. So if you have to do any work or have any knowledge or you know do any analysis to understand it, that that's a distraction that's getting away from what art really is. It should just hit you immediately emotionally and that's it. And you shouldn't have to do any work at all. And I think that's something that Iran would definitely not uh, would argue against. And I, I would argue against it too, because I've had so many experiences where something means more to you after you go through the work of understanding it than it did when, on, on first impression. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I'm hopefully, with Shri Khan's indulgence, I think I'm gonna do something on music next time. And it's a short piece that where I think it's the thing where when you actually go through and understand what's going on with it in the details of the, of the music, you get so much more out of it the second time through after the explanation than you did before. Uh, and it's not that it's like you're bringing in the outside knowledge, it's that it's helping you understand what is there in the original work. Um, and for one a further example I'd throw on there is Homer, because I just had a discussion with somebody about this. We were having an argument over, so I'm, I'm a former sort of classicist, I, I almost a classicist, uh, studied ancient Greek and read Homer in the original and that sort of thing and um, had to just argue with someone about different um, translations of Homer. And I'm a big partisan of Richmond Lattimore's translation, uh, which was the, the standard in the late 20th century. And he, somebody else was arguing in favor of Fagel's, which is a, a very widely used and very widely recommended more recent translation in the last 20 years or so. Um, and uh, the thing about Fagel's is the reputation Fagel's has is it, it's more novelistic, it's more, up to date, it doesn't reproduce all the sort of style and uh, style of expression uh, and the, the conventions of an ancient Greek epic poem. It's more like reading a novel. It's more, it makes it more immediate and more accessible to the modern reader. And that's the reason I don't like it because my, my point about it is that Homer is a little bit like Shakespeare, that having it, the fact that it's in a different style of expression, a style of expression that captures something about how the ancient Greeks told stories. So you're not just getting the story, you're also getting a sense for how did the ancient Greeks tell a story? How did they put their sentences together? How did they, how did they, how did they put all the details together? It brings you into a whole different way of thinking about something. So it's sort of like Shakespearean English, right? You can get, you can take Shakespeare's story and you can, you know, make it, they, they do this once a year, pretty much. They, they make a movie out of it, you know, with teenagers in high school, but it's a Shakespeare plot, right? <laughs> um, but it's not the same thing as Shakespeare in Shakespearean English, where the way he uses the language and the, the, the dialogue and then the poetry of it is part of the point and part of the experience of Shakespeare. So, it, so Shakespeare is a great example because it might take you effort. Uh, and I think the reason why a lot of people have difficulty with Shakespeare is it takes you effort to learn how to listen to this Shakespearean style of English. You know, which is an old fashioned, it's an out of date style of, English, of speaking English. So it takes a little work to understand this Shakespearean style of English and way of expressing yourself. But once you do, you expand, it's like you expand your mind and you, you, you get into appreciating a whole different way of thinking about things and a whole different way of talking and having your mind work. And that's part of the, a crucial part of the experience of the art. So that's why I pitch for the the necessity of making of doing the work to understand things. Now, the, the pitfall of that is something you mentioned, which is sometimes the great classics that you've been told you ought to read are not really all that good. <laughs> and so sometimes you take the you take the chance you're going to put in a lot of work to try to understand something, and it's not really going to be that rewarding. Um, but a lot of them are, so don't don't be discouraged. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, so now. Um... Now let's go ahead and um, so Marisa, Rob, and Sherry, you're welcome to comment on or answer any of the questions you want to pick up on. So who'd like to go first? Um, I I want to uh, address um, two two specific points here. Um, one is um, I just I love what um, Rupali said about um, dance and about finding nature in everything and how do we do that you know so you know my my nieces and nephews are mostly grown because my siblings are procreated often and very young but so i have had the 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 fortune of being like the great aunt right but to all of my my nieces and my nephews 
whenever we would hang out, I said, remember, whatever you do, whenever you find yourself standing directly under a tree, look up. Now, when you say this to a two-year-old, they look at you a wonder, like if they're gonna find this like amazing treat when they look up. But I say this to them when they're two, I say it to them when they're four, I say it to them when they're 16. I will say I have about 20 nieces and nephews. I had one, only one ever question me what I meant. I think of that as being how one views art. They never asked me what I meant because they, they internalized their own vision of what I meant. Mm. And basically, you know, I guess it's just a different way of saying stop and smell the roses. And honestly, a little bit selfish because I am super fascinated by trees. So then I look less strange if the kid is stopping to look up at a tree. Nobody questions why the 30 or 40 year old is doing the same. Um, but I, I, I really do agree with, um, you know, Rupali that we will live more well-rounded lives if we can find a way to see art in those things surrounding us. I don't find that that necessarily has to be a contradic contradiction with Ayn Rand's perspective on art, because if she tells us that, you know, art is how we concretize our value judgments, who's to say that we can't do that while dancing or while cooking? You know, my, my favorite memories of my mom are of her dancing while cooking. So, you know, it's just, it's one of those things. And also I have to say, Rupali, thank you, because I am a finance person. My day to day, I, I am, you know, analyzing just vast amounts of numbers. I have often had an inferiority complex a little bit when I get around these great minds that seem like so much more artistic than I am. But you brought up two or three aspects in your two minutes. And I'm like, wait, I do those things. Wait, maybe there's a little more art in me than I thought. And um, that's just lovely. So I, I thank you very much for that. Rob or Sherry? You yeah. can go okay. first if you're um, One thing, this keeps, this is um, Ayn Rand's view of what is art and what isn't art is a question that's come up at uh, just about every one of our sessions so far. And um, I wanted to read the last line of this um, chapter again. An artist reveals his naked soul in his work. And so gentle reader, do you when you respond to it? Um, we have to remember she was an artist before really she was a philosopher. Maybe she was both at the same time, but um, her reaction to these other works of art, that's her, in part, it's her philosophical mind responding, but also you have to understand it's her visceral sense of life responding and she is rejecting those things. Uh, she explains why she's rejecting those things. That doesn't mean that you have to, <laughs> you know, it's because she explains in, in every one of these chapters so far, we've talked about this, that a sense of life reaction is very deeply personal. And so try not to get hung up on what she says should or shouldn't be art and think about it um, in your own life first um, and understand what she's saying when she's saying this. this. This is also her sense of life reaction that's coming through. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was art education. Mm -hmm. um, it is horrendous um, what has become of art education. Um, I'm not sure who said this about history. Art history should be part of it. Yes, it should be. Um, these days, I don't think public schools teach art or art history much at all. It's one of those things that's been put on the chopping block um, to make sure you have more test time or whatever it is. In independent schools, um, it's usually more there. 
Um, but even then, most of the independent schools that I have toured and looked at, um, if you go and take a look at their art history department or their art department, when they do art history with it, it's often from the modern world forward. They yeah, do a lot of Picasso, Van Gogh, um, a lot of who's uh, the uh, mobiles the names on the tip Calder Cal Calder, Calder um, a lot of the moderns and they and because I think they can teach an art history lesson on Calder and then they can do a project where the kids are learning how to make mobiles so there's a link but you can't teach a kid Michelangelo and then carve a stone sculpture <laughs> so they just kind of ignore literally everything before that um that in our house means it's extra work on our part yeah. we are filling in those blanks um and so that's it's it's a sad state of affairs and it's what's uh leading lots and lots of people to not have that basic level of how to look at a work of art how to understand it and part of that also comes from when you look at a work of art and make a judgment on it, you have often very many teachers who, are, who aren't gonna be gentle about it. And they're gonna push their own view on those children and tell them, this is great. You have to like this, which is wrong. Um, and they are doing that because of their own selfish self-consciousness that they need to have other people agree with them. Um, so it's a uh, it's hard to find an art educator who will allow children their full, free, independent judgment, and still teach them uh, without their own heavy hand on it. Rob, um, so one uh, thing that keeps coming up here, and I think actually Jonathan is the one who keeps asking questions uh, relating to this. I think, it, uh, but it's it's the thing. I think it's very totally appropriate he's doing that because in a way it's one of the most radical things in here is this idea of connection between art and cognition. Mm -hmm. That art is not just about feeling, it's also about thinking and that the thinking connects to the feeling and, and how does that work? Uh, because that is, uh, I mentioned that that's, so there's a whole sort of theory of art that basically says, no, it's all just, you know, art correct connects directly to your emotions. And if you have to think about it, that's, that, that's wrong, that just gets in the way. And, a major recurring theme of this in Ayn Rand's analysis and also in a lot of the stuff I'm pushing is that what you're thinking and what, what your ideas are and, and the, the ideas and the, the, the cognition you have to do to understand what's happening in a work of art that adds to the experience and that's a central part of the experience. And that's one of the reasons why to jump on this issue of art education. Uh, one of my sort of crusades here is I think we're in a low, we live in a lowbrow culture right now. Uh, I've done a little research on this and some interesting things like uh, when uh, in the 1950s, the Metropolitan Opera, uh, the, the New York Metropolitan Opera's uh, radio broadcast, they used to, you know, they, they still do radio broadcasts on the weekends, or at least they did before coronavirus, uh, radio broadcasts on the weekends, so they broadcast an opera on the radio. These used to get audiences like 10 or 15 million people, enormous audiences. And of course, they don't get that now. We have a culture that has become, I think, for some, and there's been an attempt, I think, deliberately to make it this way, where, you know, no culture goes without art, but we have a culture that sort of goes without highbrow art. And so most, the average person coming up, their exposure to art is, you know, I, I, not that I'm against these, but I use them as an example, is, is, you know, superhero, you know, Marvel superhero movies. And it, it's popular music on the radio and they're not getting that exposure to classical music or to opera or to Shakespeare. And because, precisely because those things are more, and those things are the things that are specifically that require more education in them and more exposure to what are the references behind art. I mean, are you, under, are you going to understand Michelangelo's David if you don't understand who David is and what the story of David and Goliath is, right? So because those require more education and more exposure to a wider range of things to understand, all this great art sort of disappears from the culture. And so I think one of, and, and it, that's explained by the fact that because cognition has this role in art, that if you cut off cognition and education 
from art, then you are cutting off a whole range of great art that people just aren't going to be able to experience or aren't going to know is out there and aren't going to understand the references that would allow them to decode it and to understand what's happening. So that I, you know, I'm a huge uh, proponent of the fact that we need to have uh, uh, more and better education in art, and especially in you know ex in the in the highbrow art that people are not going to be exposed in, to in their ordinary lives necessarily. Um, I want to make a point about art and history. Um, it is difficult to grasp the mind of somebody who is, you know. 200 years or 2000 years ago. But art provides us a way of doing that. I mean, for, and you can, because what happens is that when, even when they're trying to understand these people, by default, we use all the ideas that we have about people now and uh, about our entire context. To give you an example is that I was stunned the first time I read, I read Greek plays because you can see the starkness of the language, kind of black and white, no nonsense, moral issues faced vividly and directly. And it was stunning. And the same thing happens with music, same thing happens with sculpture, everything. So it provides us uh, you know, art because it corresponds to sense of life, actually how people held the philosophy at that time, it provides us a crucial data point about what these minds were and what these philosophies meant. Like what was the worldview during the medieval times? You can actually see it in the art and you can see what it looks like. In particular, I recommend these large museums that have chronological adjust, uh, you know, arrangements. British uh, Portrait Gallery has a fantastic series of self-portraits by various artists, okay? It is the most fascinating thing over, I think, hundreds of years. So you can see how people saw themselves over time. Louvre has, Louvre continued into Museum d'Orsay has a series of French paintings. Um, Met over here in New York also has a series and you can see cultures change. You can see philosophies change just with your eyes. It's the most incredible thing. And that's what, that's what art is, you know, because it captures sense of life of a person, of a time, it allows us to, it allows us a peek into that. Um, very fast. All right. Uh, any final comments, uh, Sherry, Rob, or Maritza? Okay. All right. So folks, this was uh, wonderful. Thank you very much for coming. I just want to let you know that we have the next meetup starting in 15 minutes at five o'clock. It's going to be on personalities, you know, differences between uh, people and what kind of methods you can use to develop creativity for different personalities, depending on what your strengths are. Uh, so that's going to be at five o'clock. So we're gonna take a little break. Uh, you can stick on it, it's going to uh, continue only uh, just in this, uh, this particular um, Zoom meeting over here. So we can go ahead and you can just uh, stick around but I'm going to take a short break so I can get a little bit to eat before the next one. All right. All right. Thank you very much, folks. Thank uh, you, everyone. You. Bye, guys. Bye. We'll Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. We have to leave. I think I, I think I might hang around for a little bit on the next one. Wonderful. I'm curious. <laughs> I'm going to um, take a break, though. Yes, me too. I'll be back. Bye. 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 Bye.